Greetings! In this video, I'm going to walk you through the process of building an Exceed compatible basic cluster using virtual machines. I'll be using VirtualBox, but the process is fairly similar regardless of what virtualization software or even hardware you'll be using for your own cluster. This cluster has a simple design, just a front end connected to the outside world in an internal network, which is connected to the compute nodes. There will be four parts to this build, making the front end, configuring it, adding compute nodes, and then configuring the scheduling software. Step 1. Building the front-end machine. To begin, we define the hardware for our front-end machine within VirtualBox, which will run the CentOS 6 operating system. Now, ROX requires at a minimum at least 1 gigabyte of RAM on the front-end machine and all compute nodes. We'll also create a virtual disk here. All the defaults are fine. ROX does require a minimum of 30 gigabytes for the hard drive. We'll give it 40 just to be safe. Now we can get to what would normally be the BIOS settings. The important part here for installing is the optical disk is the first option in the boot process. And now the networks. Our first adapter will be connected to the internal network where the front end will talk to the compute nodes. The order here is important. We're picking the first adapter internal and making our second adapter external. This is the order that ROX prefers things to be. So it'll simplify things <clears throat> later on in the installation. Now we can choose our installation media, which we've downloaded from the ROX website. <clears throat> This is actually really easy to get to. You'll just go to www.rocksclusters.org, <clears throat> go to downloads, and we've downloaded this handy jumbo DVD that contains pretty much all of the roles made by ROX. Roles are just the software packages that ROX provides. So we insert that disk into the optical drive and boot up our front-end virtual machine. At this point you have to quickly type build or else it will automatically default to installing a compute node instead of your front-end machine. And now at this point you'll start your friendly interactive ROX install. The first step is to choose your roles or software packages that you want to install. Typically in ROX we select Base, Bio, Ganglia, which is a monitoring system, HPC has cluster tools, Java, Kernel, and OS are exactly what they sound like as are Perl and Python. Now we want to insert some additional software to make this really an Exceed-like cluster. So we're choosing a role that we downloaded from the ROX website to install the Torque Resource Manager, which will really turn this thing into a cluster. And we also have a special Exceed role, which contains scientific software that's similar to what is found on the larger Exceed resources. So we'll pick that role and continue on to the next step. Now at this step we're just filling out basic information about our cluster. If you're building this in a virtual machine, don't use an actual domain name that resolves to something or else you'll get strange errors down the road. Normally before you install a, a physical cluster you'll have this set up with your local DNS admin. Now the network configuration, this is important. This is the interface for the public network. Make sure it says F1 or else ROX will be confused when you start up in the future and you'll have to swap the interfaces within the ROX database. Within VirtualBox, 
this is defaults to 10.0.3.15. Um, normally, again, you'll have an, a static IP from your local administrators if you're building an actual cluster. And then this will be the internal network, which defaults to 10.1.1, and we'll keep that default for, for this. Again, these are this gateway and DNS server setting comes from within VirtualBox. And we'll choose a root password. Don't forget this. It'll be important when you want to log in again. Uh, you'll choose your time zone here. Again, pretty standard. Looking for Chicago. We'll choose auto partitioning. Um, the manual partitioning does work fairly well, but it's a little trickier than, than taking the standard. And the, the standard works fine for a demo cluster. So, Now at this point, Rox will start building all of the roles that you've requested. Your only only steps at this point is to keep inserting the same DVDs that you used, you used earlier when you were choosing your roles. In real life, unfortunately, this takes much longer. And now we can put in the torque roll. Oh, that was fast. And now you run around to the front of your cluster again and put in your exceed disk. Now, since this is the last roll that we've selected, you're off to the races. You can take this time to go get some coffee or tea or whatever your poison of choice is. Luckily I've sped things up a little bit in this video so you won't have to wait through all of it. But from here until the front end reboots it's pretty much just waiting. Oh, and there it is, rebooting rocks. And here we go to your standard CentOS 6 login screen. So now we've got a successfully installed front-end machine. The next step, of course, is to actually configure it, make sure that all of the networks are set up correctly, and download a little bit of extra software prior to configuring compute nodes. But like I said, the most important part is checking the network. So hopefully you didn't forget your root password here. And you can safely ignore that.
So our first step is to check that the network interfaces came up correctly. We'll open up a terminal and run ifconfig. Boom, there we go. So we want to make sure that the right devices are associated with each interface. Notice the MAC address here for both ETH0, which is the private network, and ETH1, which is the public network. And they came up with the right IP, so that's good. So now we'll check that ROX knows about the right interfaces. So run ROX list host interfaces. And here you should compare the MAC addresses to make sure the right card got associated with that interface. This is where problems creep up most of the time with physical hardware. Sometimes rocks will switch these and then it's a real pain to switch them back. But everything here worked okay. So let's make sure we can see the outside world. I'll try to ping the mothership at exceed.org. That's not good. Oh, okay, so let's make sure that we can see the DNS server that's provided by VirtualBox, which was at 10.0.3.3. .3. Okay, that works fine. Let's try again. Okay, so now we can see the IP for exceed.org. This is something that I've only encountered in VirtualBox, but I'm going to show how to fix it here because, well, there's not a lot of information out there about building a virtual rocks cluster. Okay, so it worked okay, but pretty slow. So now we're going to go into the configuration for ETH1, which is our public interface. So it's in networks, Etsy, Sysconfig, Network Scripts, IFCFG, ETH1. And we'll change the boot, po boot protocol to DHCP so that it will talk to the VirtualBox server. And then restart the network. <clears throat> everything came back fine. Let's try to ping again. And everything behaves normally again. So we're good to go. Now, <clears throat> the next thing we're going to do is download some software from provided by Exceed that will actually provide statistics back to Exceed about this new cluster we've built. In the future, this will be part of the Exceed role. It is a completely non-invasive script, so you'll be asked for confirmation before any information gets emailed back. And I'll show later on in the video how that, what that looks like. This is very important for us, though, so that we get good statistics on who's using our software, which we can report back to NSF and make, show that we're using our funding properly. <laughs> And we'll just install that package with RPM IVH. And it only puts some files in slash opt and adds a few lines to the bash rc file for the root, which most of this stuff is making sure that it can remove itself after it's been run. Okay, so now that we've got our front end set up, what does this cluster need next? That's right, we need compute nodes. Part three. So now we're going to install and build all of the compute nodes for this cluster. This tool, Insert Ethers, is going to do all the heavy lifting here. This will run a DHCP server on the front end for when the new compute nodes come up. So you'll choose for your appliance type compute, just hit enter. And now it's running and waiting for new machines. So as before, 
we have to specify the hardware parameters in VirtualBox. And again, Linux 64-bit Red Hat. Um, and again, 1 gig of RAM, at least 30 gigabytes of hard drive. We'll give it 40 again to be safe. And now, this part's very important. You have to specify the boot parameters for your compute node. And we want to make sure that the first thing to boot is network and then hard drive. Because it's actually going to get a kickstart file from the front end machine, so you don't have to do anything else. And you only need one network adapter attached to the internal network. You have to make sure not to use the Intel option for the network card here, otherwise it won't work. Okay, so now you've specified all that stuff. And fire up your compute node, and we'll see what happens. Okay, so it's running the Pixie boot on the compute node, looking running a DHCP request on the internal server, and there we go, insert ethers, seize the compute node, and it's found found the MAC address. You can check that if you're paranoid about other devices sending out DHCP requests on your internal network, but this is pretty safe here. Okay, it's getting the kickstart file from the front end. And there you can see insert ethers has a, a tiny asterisk in between those parentheses for compute zero zero. Which means that it has sent the installation images to the first compute node. Now it names these nodes by compute MN, where M is say a rack number and N is the number in the rack. If you're if you want to be careful, make sure to boot your compute nodes up in order when you're doing physical hardware so that the naming convention makes sense. And now it just starts the normal rocks install process on the compute node. So you just have to wait around for a while again. But while that's happening, we can go ahead and fire up compute node number two. Again, same old 64-bit Linux, 1 gig of RAM, 40 gig hard drive. Make sure network comes first. Otherwise, bad things happen. Internal network, not the Intel chip. Allow VMs, and we're good to go. Don't let it load the installation CD. <laughs> oh, and insert ethers found the second one. And you can see it does not have an asterisk yet. At this point, since we're only building two compute nodes, you're safe to go get coffee or tea or whatever you enjoy the most at this point. It's a waiting game. Hopefully the machines you're using actually boot up fairly quickly. Sometimes this can take a, a long time for everything to install and boot on if you're using older hardware.
Okay, and since we've installed compute nodes, you can exit insert ethers. And we'll wait for the second one to finish booting again. So now we've got compute nodes. We're done building the cluster. And we can report back to Xseed about what we just what we just built so that we can go back to the NSF and say, hey look, <laughs> these guys built an awesome new cluster. You should give us more funding to support more people doing this. So I'm just going to first make sure, yep, Rock sees the new hosts. And they all have interfaces up on the private network. So let me show you what this inventory script is going to actually do. You'll open up a new terminal, and oh, that's different. You'll get this message asking you to send to run this script and send an email out to exceed. If you block port 25, don't do this because it will fill up your logs and you'll run out of this space surprisingly quickly. So we're going to just hit E to generate a report that we can manually email out to exceed. So it runs, it found, it checks your slash proc slash CPU and gets, gets information about what kind of cluster this is. And so you can check in slash opt slash xcbc inventory slash cluster info. And that's that's all the information that would get sent to back to us at Campus Bridging to report to NSF. Very simple, just saying this this many processors, this much memory, so that we can give a sort of estimate of how many theoretical flops you have for you know just showing off a little bit. And there's all that stuff in the bash RC from earlier, which, after you run it, cleans itself out completely. So our next step here is to turn this thing into a real life cluster and set up the scheduler. Now we've set up some tools in Campus Bridging using Ansible to make this even easier than it already is. So you can download from software.exceed.org um, a set of scripts that we've written <clears throat> to both install Ansible and then help you configure your XCBC cluster. Now installing Ansible is literally as simple as downloading the source code from GitHub and sourcing some environment variables. You don't have to actually install anything anywhere other than the source directory. And like I said, changing some environment variables. We have a install script ready made to make that simple because there's a few Python libraries that need to be installed with it. So we'll put install Ansible in the root directory and run it. So it runs some, some pip and easy install to get, get Python libraries. And now we're cloning from GitHub. And it ran a small test job just on the local host. So Ansible is set up and working. It's just set, got an Etsy Ansible host file that only has the head node in it. If you really wanted to, you could admit it now administer your cluster from another machine that had Ansible on it. 
So first we're going to set up the scheduler. This is the playbook to do that. It just creates an, a default queue and adds all of the compute nodes to that queue. So all you have to do to that to create this queue is do well, first we make sure we have all of our environment variables, which is comes in a script provided by Ansible. So now you can run Ansible playbook, torque playbook, and it creates an empty queue, populates the queue, and makes it the default. So now if you run qstat q, you see our default queue that has two CPUs in it. And you can see our PBS nodes are available. Next step we need to do is add some users to actually run something from the queue, since you can't really run things as you root. It's just the standard Linux user add, we'll call it new user one, and we'll give it a stupid password for testing purposes. Now, when you create a new user, you have to run rocks sync users so that the rocks database knows about the new user and will populate the compute nodes with information so that the user can actually run things on them. A very important step. So now we have a user. Let's uh, log out of root. Well, not log out. We'll switch users into new user one. Hopefully, you didn't forget the password. So, first thing we'll do is open up a terminal. Normally, the user would just SSH into this machine, so everything's going to be on the command line. And we've got an example job in slash export slash apps slash node query dot job and we'll put it in our home directory to be able to run from here and it's just a simple PBS script that runs hostname on all of the compute nodes on the cluster we'll submit it with qsub node query dot job and you can see the full job status with qstat-f, which is way too much information. If you want a simpler view, you know, just run without dash f, and you'll get a short list of all the jobs that are currently running in the default queue. This is zero time, we'll just give it a second. and check it again, no change. We'll run show start, make sure everything's okay. Ah, couldn't find the job zero, so it must, it must have already completed. Yep, and there you can see our output files. So we'll run cat nodes.out. And there you can see it was supposed to run compute nodes 0 and 1, and it did. So when you run host name, you get that dot local. So everything's success. We're, we've got a user who can run jobs on all the nodes. This cluster is good to go for demo purposes. So that user can log out. And, well, there we have it. We've got a working XCBC. I hope you've all enjoyed this video. Uh, for more information, please visit www.xseed.org. That's xsede.org, and check out the campus bridging section. We've got everything you've seen in the video available there, along with more uh, textual <laughs> tutorial information. And thanks again for watching.